welcome back to Information Revolution, a podcast for people working with information or just passionate about it. Um, my name is Michael Upton. I'm an information consultant here in Wellington, New Zealand. I'm here today with uh, Judy. Judy Verno. <laughs> my name is Judy Verno, and I'm also a consultant working in Wellington. We both work for MetaTaxis, and I'm an information architect. And I'm Carl Melrose. I'm a information consultant from South Australia, and we are also joined this morning by. Hi, I'm Matt Moore, coming to you from Sydney, Australia. Uh, and my background is I originally trained as a librarian, but I'm Hooray! not anymore. All the yeah. best people. <laughs> Library science in the house. Yeah. Ranganathan down. Anyway. <laughs> And I've, I've been trying to I've been trying to remember where I first met you, Matt, because I you know but you I know I know that you've been you've been doing the information innovation series with UTS for you you did that how long did you do that for oh, about five or six years yeah so I, I was aware of that but I've actually just been I've been racking my brain to figure out where I met you and I cannot remember so do you know I think it was the information innovation thing I think you came along to one of the early ones in. Like late 2017, early 2018. Yeah, probably right. with Sonia was, it, from it Objective. Was exactly, it was you and Sonia Sherman, right? It was. Um, so oh, for you didn't my even let the man finish his intro. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't let the man finish his intro, you know. But I, I wanted people to get a sense that you know Matt's been around for a while, and I, I feel like you know if you've been running a, a an inf- something a, a series of podcasts and lectures through a major university for a while, you know, you you should have a little bit of cred in the industry. Well, I, I did teach on the Digital uh, Information Management Masters at University of Technology, Sydney, before they, ins- before they unceremoniously canned it in 2020. And I, I did that for about oh, 11 years, you know. So, so, so you know a few things, you, you, you learn a few things. You, 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 you stumble upon a few things, generally, I find, Carl, like generally when you're looking for something else. And, and, so... uh, and, and speaking of stumbling upon things, um, there were some things that you and I had a conversation about after one of the episodes that we shot, and you and you definitely wanted to share a few more things about a few a few of your thoughts on. Uh, do you want do you, do you want to do you want to do you want to tell us where you where you think you know where, what's, what was my performance what was my performance uh, improvement plan after that uh, after that call, Matt? Where 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 do you where do you feel you were going to take us? Well, like, like got gold stars, everyone. They were all great sessions. So I think we're, we're referring to the the last two sessions, right? So the the, mm. the one with the three of you about information valuation, and then the one you have with James from Experience Matters, right? Both excellent excellent discussions so we're just kind of we're going to build on that we're going to take it forwards it's a yes and scenario not a no but scenario okay excellent but 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 you did have you did have you did have something to share with us about lunch or food or or it was something like that oh uh, the table i think you're referring we'll come to the table in a little bit okay so okay so what i heard in your the, the the discussion you were having like the the first one was was okay so the underlying question is well like why do we want to value information why are we doing this mm-hmm. okay and the theme i was hearing well like we want we want to we want to use it to get resources and respect in the organizations for the things that we love and we think are useful Okay, as I was, it was Rodney Dangerfield's line was about like, though, I get a no respect or whatever, right? So it was kind of like the Rodney Dangerfield scenario for information management. Okay, so I thought of it like that, but I, I, I feel like you've got a high level of agreement on this call at the moment. <laughs> so, so and I think it's worth taking a step back and saying, well, okay, so like we're interested in respect, and we'll come to respect in a moment. But okay, how we want resources. So that obviously begs the question, well, how do resources get allocated in organizations? And I think there are two opposite extremes here, right? And on the one extreme there is, we have a hyper-rational, like rigorously um, tested method of, you know, defining the value of any particular project, what its impact on our discounted cash flows will be, you know, what its net present value is, 
all this stuff, right? What's our return on investment, putting this in the business case. Then on the other, we have um, who's playing golf with the CEO that week, right? Or throwing darts at a dartboard and seeing you know, where those particular darts land, right? Now, organizations mostly talk about the former, right? Because that's respectable, okay? But in my experience, like what you see is organizations behaving all the way along this spectrum, right? And it's important for us to know how organizations and senior executives and stakeholders in those organizations make decisions because basically that defines what we need to do, right? And like, should we like be learning the techniques of information valuation or should we just be upping our golf game? Right. That's the key question. Right. And it's a, I mean, it was the, it was a brilliant point. And I, th- I think I've, I've mentioned to you, I think I've mentioned to all of you that I've been running an executive engagement um, masterclass with Rimper. And I, I, I ran the first, I ran the first version last year. It was about three months. We're going to run it again this year. But I think that's going to be one of the, I, I'm, since we had that conversation, I'm thinking about putting another, an, another class in, based on the idea that you've got to figure out how your organization makes decisions because you know there's a certain way of thinking about how organizations make decisions that is is sort of underlying the course that I've built which is that essentially you know you've got to figure out what people want and then you've got to figure out how to deliver to them um but I feel I almost feel like what you've just said is yeah it, yes it, it is the same thing but you also have to be, have a little bit more awareness under there about how exactly they make decisions. As you say, do you need to go and learn, you know, net present value and, you know, how, how to do a good return on investment calculation, all those sorts of things? Or do you actually just need to learn better water cooler conversation and, you know, how to get your, how to get your invitation to the country club, that kind of thing? And I'm actually thinking about putting that in. There's a few, you know, we're, because we're about to rerun it. So, And that and- can be quite, quite hard if you're as information management people often are if you're quite a long way down the pecking order and no one would even consider asking you to go play golf with them because you're just they don't even know who you are for example and it might be quite hard equally to find out how those decision making processes are made so it's not just uh, you you need to be really good at, at working out how to find out if you see what I mean. And Michael, do you have any thoughts? I think I think you're right, Judy. I think and you're absolutely right. And, and we'll come to the things that we might do in a moment. But Michael, what are your thoughts? I, I guess I mean what stands out for me in that is that if you are down at that extreme at the um, Caddyshack, just to connect to a, a Rodney Dangerfield reference, at the Caddyshack end of the extreme where you're playing golf <laughs> and um, whatever else is going on there and chasing gophers, then um, uh, that's a scenario that I actually feel is much harder to influence in the sense that it's about um, a whole lot of social norms and a whole lot of connecting mm-hmm. with other people about what they expect their kind of buddies are going to be like. Exactly. And it's not just about being down the pecking order. It's about being perceived as a giant nerd, <laughs> which I'm very <laughs> comfortable to own. However, it might not line up with the kind of, um, I mean, there'd be a classic stereotype of a group of men who are very sort of outspoken and sporty and bold and out there on the on the on you know playing the game, um, and uh, yeah, just something something sort of ticked over for me there about how um, often in this podcast I'm trying to think about what what sort of what are the things we can control, what are the things that we have power over, what are the things we can work on. I'm all big on growth mindsets and la la la, but this might be one where you actually bang against basically um, social constructs that you can't defeat, I guess. Um, don't know if that's too extreme a way to put it, but there you go. So can I introduce some cutting edge thought on this? <laughs> Please do. Uh, so I'm, gonna, I'm I, there's, there's a thinker <laughs> you may have heard of called Aristotle. He's a little bit edgy. <laughs> I, was waiting, I okay. was waiting for that, you know, in 2000 BC. <laughs> so... In Aristotle's rhetoric, right? Because because I, when originally I had to, uh, I had to put together a business case for a KM program, right? And often the way business 
cases are presented as these scientific things. There's the spreadsheets involved. There's numbers. There's formulas. It feels very objective. That's a lie. Okay. What you are engaged in is quantitative rhetoric. So I thought, who knows about rhetoric? This is this Aristotle guy. Let's see what he has to say. So he has some interesting things to say. And he talks about three things, which actually tie into some of the points you're making. So he talks about your, let's see if I can get these right, your nomos, sorry, your logos. Mm-hmm. Your logos, logos is your argument, right? Meaning, your logos yeah. is your data. It's the rational part of what you're putting forwards, right? And then there's your pathos. And that's the emotional connection yeah. that you're making with people when you're selling this, right? And you're, you're not just, dealing with the rational parts of them, you're dealing with the irrational parts, like their hopes, their fears, their dreams, their greed, their dignity, all that kind of stuff, right? And again, like if we're talking about information, ultimately we're talking about things like risk, we're talking about things like productivity, we're talking about making people's lives easier and better. So we can talk about things like hope and fear and greed and lust, right? Maybe not like in those terms, but that's what we're that's what we're tapping into. And the final thing he talks about is then your ethos, right? And that is the um, that is how you're seen by other people, right? So we're talking again about like you can have the best story in the world, the best data in the world, but if they're not going to believe you yeah. or accept it from you, it's not going to fly, right? Yeah. So there's a couple of sure. things there. So first of all, I think you you do need to build up your connections in the organization, which is actually easier to do than I think people think. Right. You don't have to be like a chummy kind of golf playing guy. You can be a massive nerd. You just have to be interested in other people. All right. And, and I think what defines um, information and knowledge people that I've seen is, is curiosity. Right. So leverage that curiosity. Now, I think the other thing then is maybe it shouldn't be you delivering that message. Maybe you need a champion who has that ethos, who has that respect, right? And they can sell it for you. So find that person. So those those are just some thoughts. Yeah, really good, really good points. And I think um, certainly on that, uh, in terms of those two scenarios you just described at the end there, the idea of being able to still be influential. I mean, yeah, I shouldn't discount that um and i think that i've seen plenty of people who you know perhaps don't conform to the stereotype i just described who are very influential in their organizations and make those connections and then on that second point about maybe it doesn't need to be you i mean i think mm. it's a it's a classic yeah, it's pattern a really of, of uh, uh perhaps more introverted types to just sort of go oh i need to be able to do this thing oh oh i can't and then they kind of stop there rather than i will go and work with some other people and yeah. you know those people can complement my skills well, I mean, th- this was one of the things underneath the, the executive engagement class that we ran. You know, wh- what do executives want? Well, you know, we, we did a little bit on the role of executives as capital allocators, but, you know, there, there's this, for some reason, there's this thing that, you know, you have to know what executives want, or this idea that you have to know what executives want before you go and talk to them, which, you know, I just think is crap most of the time but the whole point that we we tried to get to in the executive engagement class was just go and ask them have a conversation you know what are your top sort of three to five priorities over that and you know it's a it's a question that you know some people are going to hate and some executives are going to respond badly to (coughs) but a lot of them will actually if you ask it in a genuine manner and as you say matt i mean i think if if there's anything that information and records people have on their side it's that they are naturally curious and and i think it would it would come across as a genuine question when they asked it but just ask i mean people want to talk about this stuff i've never found an executive who didn't want to talk about the challenges that they had if you just asked a few questions and then just let them go the problem is they've never got enough time to sit down and actually you know you've got to get into the room first and exactly getting into the room is the hard bit well that that comes that brings us nicely to the table then doesn't it how do you get the seat at the table, even if it's a coffee table, you know, to ask the CEO what his, what his goals are, what his challenges are? Well, so, so let's talk about this concept of the table and unpack it a little bit. Okay, so what I would say is, so 
for my sins, I've worked across multiple disciplines in my time. You know, so learning and development, marketing, sales, you know, operations, sales operations, <laughs> consulting, all kinds of stuff, right? Um, and I've, I've touched on areas like finance as well. And what interests me is uh, you will find similar conversations happening in kind of different functional and disciplinary silos, right, that people don't seem to be aware that other people are having. And the concept of the table is we need to get a seat at the table, right? So you will find, if you just Google, like getting a seat at the table, IT, marketing, HR, whatever, right, you will find angst-ridden articles by IT people going, no one takes us seriously. They think we're the nerds in the basement, right? Like, how do we get a seat at the table, okay? HR going, everybody just thinks we're touchy-feely, you know, kind of like hippies or corporate enforcers. How do we get a seat at the table, okay? Marketing will go, people just think we like, we, 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 we care about fonts, right and brand <laughs> colors how do we get a seat at the table interestingly finance do have a seat at the table oh their, their whinge is that their seat at the table isn't big enough how do they get more of a seat at the table right everyone just thinks we're the bean counters right we're just there for the nasty things in life and cost control how do we get a bigger seat? how are we seen as sort of like so again i think there's this it's interesting there's this widespread angst with everybody thinks they're not important enough everybody thinks their thing doesn't matter enough all right and I think there's a few things to unpack there before we start scheming to get a seat at the table. The first of it is what sort of ta- – I'm just envisaging – there was that picture of Putin and Macron, right? You remember? Like, yeah, like, yeah, sitting at the table. the table is enormous. Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. right. Yeah. So it's yeah, like yeah, how yeah. big does this table have to be for everybody to get a seat there? I actually thought that was a spoof of the Michael Keaton um, Batman original when I first saw it, because there is actually a scene where Michael Keaton and what's the very pretty girl from that? Um, is it Kim Basinger? Or is it, it, is, it is Kim Basinger, yeah. Oh, you're right. It's the first one, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, Michael Keaton sitting at one end and Kim Basinger is sitting at the other end of this enormous table and she asks for the salt and he has to get up and it's about a it's about a 15 second walk to the other end of the table i i i, I, I honestly i don't think vladimir putin has that level of self awareness but never mind <laughs> <laughs> just likes to shout so anyway so we've got everybody wanting a seat at the table right everybody wanting to get into the executive's ear right now on the flip side think about what it's like to be that executive okay i got a taste of that when i was an it manager and this is not going to be the most politically correct metaphor but i suddenly understood what it was like to be a hot chick in a nightclub right there were people constantly contacting me from LinkedIn or getting my phone number off the switchboard going like, hey, can I just have five minutes of your time to find out what your top 10 priorities are? Can I have your email address to send me this white paper? Because like my profile said I was an IT manager at a like significant Australian. Very company, large organization. Right? Yep. And it was like, and I would just go, look, like I'm not interested. No offense to you. I'm just not interested. Mm-hmm. And you're the 10th person that day to ask me that. Okay, so I think first of all, right, and the other thing I'd say is when you get a seat at the table, like with great power comes great responsibility. So if you say I can change your business, right, like because like and again, I've heard it described in sales terms as you call a guy and you say I can I can solve a five million dollar problem for you. And they go, great. I only care about 50 million dollar problems. Right. So if you get your seat at the table, it's like, okay, we're talking about existential challenges for this organization. Right. Is, you know, like, what have you got? Okay. So I think there's a, like, be careful what you wish Mm. for. There will be some situations where you are dealing with an existential challenge and you own that seat at the table. But be, like I say, be careful what you wish for. It, it it is a, it, it's a very good point, and one of the one of the things that we actually said in the in the executive engagement course is that if you can't get through to executives, start with team leaders. Find out what team leaders' priorities are. Find out what matters to them. 
I actually think that's, and that's something I think I'm on record saying many times across this series is that if you, you know, don't start with the $500,000 project, you know, start with the $5,000 project or the $1,000 project where you can make someone's life better, gain an advocate and move on to bigger problems. Well, it's, 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 it's how the FBI take down the mafia, right? You start with the, the soldiers at the street level, you flip them and then you work your way up. Right, and I think you need to take. We might put that in the course. I think you need to take. (laughs) I think you need to often take a similar. And like, okay, so here's the thing: you do right once you've talked to the team leader. The conversation you have with their boss is, "Hey, I've heard these are your top three priorities. Right? Is that true, or or are these other people smoking something? Right? Now, we're talking Cunningham's law here. So Cunningham's law is the best way to find the correct answer is to post the wrong answer on the internet. Okay. <laughs> now, if you go to an executive saying, this is what I've heard, they'll go, well, that's very interesting. They'll either say, yeah, that's true. Or they'll go, what? No, 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 no. This is what we care about. What's wrong with people? Okay. So well, what's going... wrong with people is they're obviously not listening because how could they possibly be so unaligned with all of the things that I'm thinking about? How does my team not know what our pro our exactly. strategic is? Now, just it, it, and then he goes off and fires the whole team. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. well, let's 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 hope it's not as, as, as no, nuclear as that. Would be a bad start to your program. Like, like but like, like I, I think that's very unlikely to happen. But again, I think like the the power. Again, one thing I've seen the power is in not like again people. I, I actually think like the tell me what keeps you awake at night. Tell me your three priorities. People do get a bit sick about that, right? But what does get you the feet in the door is if you've done the pre-work and you go, this is what I think they are based on this, this, and this. Am I right or wrong? And they'll go, and that will generally get you, okay, this person's like actually done the pre-work. They've, they've gone some of the way to earning that conversation. And that's the power of the roll-up, right? That, that like I think look, that Carl is talking about and all of you are talking about is like, like in, doing the, in doing the groundwork, with the people below you then get to actually like the, the, the most beautiful thing is when you go into a meeting with somebody and you tell them something they don't know about their business right. we did this work with your team we noticed this was going on with the team right it's not at their level to fix it this is something you need to fix and this is how you do it right all of a sudden it's like okay keep talking you've just been useful <laughs> exactly mm. yeah We've, we've had conversations before and, and here about applying uh, consultative selling skills. So I was taught, you know, sales techniques as a consultant. And a lot of it comes down to that, that really the compelling conversation is not one where you roll up and just go, you know, what do you need? I'm here to help. But rather like, oh, hey, I reckon you need help with this. You know, I've seen these things, you know, and exactly what you're describing, Matt, when you, you bring something to the table (laughs) Mm, mm. yeah and i certainly think there is also um, you know i I really connected with what you're saying there about um uh kind of be careful what you wish for in terms of what is it that you actually bring to the organization and what are the kinds of problems you are trying to solve um i mean i think it is emphasizing stuff we've said before in this in this podcast but just that thing that um, you know, you, you do need to be operating. I mean, you, you do need to be conscious of the level that you want to be operating at. You know, not only where are you operating, but where is it that you think you're going to deliver that value? And if it is actually at a relatively operational level, then sometimes, you know, ego-wise, that might be a hard pill to swallow, but it might actually really help you to get on with your work and, um, and you know, and deliver that benefit, mm-hmm. you know, deliver mm-hmm. value, um, do, do a good thing, basically, you know, at the most fundamental Um rather than going right i need to go all the way to the top it's like maybe that's not maybe that's not where i fit in this particular organization i'm in you know and then that's fine like a couple of things i absolutely agree with you michael and what i would say is like i would much rather have a mid-level manager Mm. completely engaged and bought in to working with me than somebody more senior who never takes my calls and won't do anything Right, because like you'll actually get more done, right? And also, hey, that person might get promoted someday, <laughs> right? Especially if you've helped them succeed. So, also, I think it's often important to see the big picture and play the long game, 
and like just rewinding back to something that Judy said about actually understanding how these decision making processes really happen rather than how people mm. say they happen because these are two different things right then you have to take in effect you're, you're going to be a scientist here right so your first business case your first attempt to get this stuff will probably fail right and you want it you want it to fail in a useful way it's almost like when you sort of inject dye into someone's bloodstream, right? You want to see how your attempt, like how your business case to run your project gets received and processed by the organization and highlight how it actually makes decisions. So if you've got a bullet, what you think is a, if you've got what finance tells you is a bulletproof business case, right? And also you've done some pre-work in terms of like like the political behind the scenes, like like consensus building, and it fails, then okay, what does that tell you? Like is it is it that you're not aligned to the priorities that everybody's talking about? Okay. Is there something else that's going on? But like like again, if you don't hit it the first time, don't give up. Right? This is we're we're scientists here, right? Most experiments end in failure. We will get there and we will learn in the process. Yeah, I think you made. I think you made a, a a really good point too about the that sort of middle management layer. Um, I've often found it's much more productive to work with the middle management layer than it is to work with a, an executive manager. Anyway, you know, I mean, m most of my most of my meetings with C level managers are, you know, generally I'll, I'll book twenty minutes, and generally I'll know exactly what I want from them before I go in. You know, it's a the, the the thing I want from the, the thing I want from them is, you know, I need, well, you know, recent uh, recent example, you know, I, I need three hundred thousand dollars for this thing, you know, these are the challenges that we that we've that we looked at and that we've built into the project. Um, this is the problem. This is the risk and everything else. And you know, will you sponsor the project? And generally, we've been a success if I've known what to ask for before I go in. Um, and it's it's more but, likely but that, that those C level managers are feeling the pain, isn't it? Than the, the, people the, higher up, they're more likely to be understanding that pain is being felt at least amongst well, the, the team. The middle the middle managers are, are kind of the sense making layer, you know, that sort of director level layer. They're the people who are actually really owning the problems. And this is the thing that I that that I keep finding. If you can, once you're talking to a and and it depends on the type of organization you're in you know i mean if you're thinking if you're looking at something and saying you know you've got manager senior manager director c level person um you know ceo or whatever it happens to be i mean if you if you're looking at that kind of structure um the directors are the ones that own the problem they're the ones who are making sense of the organization generally for that c level executive and if you understand the problem that they're dealing with and you can get there, you know, you can get them really buying into it and feeling like if they give, if they get you the time with that C-level person to actually move a project forward, they're going to have a good outcome. You know, that's where I've found most of my success. So, you know, I, I think we, we, we do over, we do overdo the, the role of the executive. I mean, add to that too, you know, you look at most director level people in big organizations and I mean, they can sign off 50, 100, $200,000, you know, w without a lot of extra approval from other parts of the organization. Not a bad place to start. And, yeah. and where is your own boss in all this? I mean, should, shouldn't they be helping you if they've hired you or they've, well, they've got it, you? Then depends on the boss, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. All right. So, so I, th I think what I'd say is it's critical to have your boss aware of what you're doing, right? If they are capable of doing this, right, then work with them, okay? Not all bosses are capable of doing <laughs> this, right? So what you want to do is go, hey, you're, what you're doing here is really, really busy and important. I just need to do this other little thing over here. I'll keep you informed because nobody likes sort of like being missed out of the loop. But, you know, I think, you know, your your range of managerial competence will vary along a continuum mm. in an organization. All right. Um, yeah. But yes, absolutely. If they're there, they are your first champion. So as a bit of an information revolution first, 
we're going to split this one into two parts. So here ends part one. And thank you very much for listening to this. And we're going to bring Matt back for a second round in the conversation. Things went so well that we thought, well, let's not make this a massive episode. We'll just chop it in two. So we look forward to uh, picking this one up in a couple of weeks' time uh, for the next episode of Information Revolution. Thanks all.